Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Off the Crutch. I'm Travis Davis. I wanted to thank all of you who listened last week to my episode with Rain. The response I received was incredible, and I'm so happy that Rain was able to be on my podcast to share her story. I'm glad to be recording again and putting out content as well. In the last episode, I touched on what I was focusing on during 2023, which was opening up an Aussie Bull business. Amid that, I had the opportunity to speak at the United Cerebral Palsy Annual Conference in Las Vegas last April. The wonderful folks at UCP gave me the opportunity to share my story of resilience and living life with cerebral palsy. I thought it would be fitting then, during Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month, to have on Armando Contreras, CEO and President of United Cerebral Palsy, on the podcast. Armando is an amazing man who has helped UCP grow to what it is today. I'm excited for you all to learn more about this organization and how it helps people with disabilities. Yeah, so Travis, first, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to um, be on this podcast. So thank you so much. Um, It's an honor, and I I highly regard you and the work that you do for the disability community. Yeah, so... uh, can you share what inspired you to take on the role of CEO at United Cerebral Palsy? I, I think I have to give a, a little bit of background because I, I've been in the disability world probably for about 13, 14 years, and I've been CEO twice. So the first time I was with the local affiliate at UCP of Central Arizona, when I was asked to consider the director's position or the CEO position, I was really thinking more of my experience with nonprofits, with for-profits, with government, and I wanted to see how I can help them build and enhance and meet their goals because I am I'm an administrator. And that was really the first thing I thought that was where their need was and to reconnect them to resources in Arizona and funding resources. Then the other piece, which not saying it's second, but it's just as important, is that in my family, my father, when I was born, I was a firstborn in 1961. My mom was in the hospital having me, but my dad was also in the hospital because he had a, it was almost a fatal car accident. So both my mom and I was going to be born, right? And my dad is in another part of the hospital. Thanks be to God, my my dad lived, but he had a disability that he could never work again, ever. So that's when we grew up in poverty, and we grew up in a really a, a wonderful place called East Los Angeles that still dear to me. And so, with that, in this next steps that I was doing back about eight nine years ago, actually more no, I'm sorry, about twelve thirteen years ago, part of it was my experience and bringing nonprofits to another level, but also I had a passion for people with disabilities because my dad, I never seen him go to work one day. So I was with him every single day growing up. So that was, there was some good, there was good things about that. And there was some challenging things about that. And then second, I have family members, my cousin in Mexico, she's a little bit older than me. And I went, I remember going to her wedding And then a year later, she was having her child, but during the pregnancy, she died and she had a a son who had cerebral palsy. So there was a lot of complications. He lives today, but he's had so many surgeries that it's been a really difficult time for the family. And then I have one other cousin that has a child with cerebral palsy as well. So it's a it lives amongst our, our family. So I do have a passion for it. And I also have the experience that we can bring an organization that does great work at the local level and make sure that there's a sustainable component to it, that there's an awareness component to it, and that there's quality of services that are being provided to children and adults. Seven years later, Travis, then we knew that United Cerebral Palsy National in Washington, D.C. was looking for the next CEO. So I decided to put my name in the hat and I eventually got hired. So using the same steps, one was a big thing was the trust level that 
felt that I could help with our affiliates and with national. There was certain things that we were not at a level that they felt that the national office was doing their job or actually how they were spending money. So the levels were quite low. So I knew I had to change some things there. In addition to that, we were not financially viable. There was a lot of expenses. I had to make some tough decisions. We were in an office, a beautiful office on K Street, a 10-minute walk to the White House, and that was super expensive for us. Fast forward seven years later, I've saved about over $60,000 a month in moving to Virginia. We have have a lot of other efficiencies. We're now financially viable. And that savings is now being invested back into our affiliate network. So to go back to your question, I believe it was a calling for me and that I knew that collaboratively with the board, with the team, with committees that we can get through the toughest times and we did. And I'm also very thankful to God and my family for assisting me with that. That's an incredible story. What do you think makes UCP unique compared to other nonprofits you've worked for or have seen? Yeah. Other nonprofits that I've worked for and other nonprofits that are providing services in the disability community, I believe that there's a lot of compliments out there and I commend them for all the work that they're doing. Easter Seals, Goodwill, Access, Anchor, a lot of organizations that are out there that are doing good. What maybe sets us apart is, one, we've been around for 75 years. Two, we're one of the few service organizations that are providing direct services to children and adults, not only with cerebral palsy, but Down syndrome, autism, developmental delays, and many other conditions, that our therapies are known to be of quality, that our staff around the nation and in Canada, there's a longevity. When I visit, I... I made 25 visits, close to maybe 30 last year. And what was common was me shaking hands of team members, of staff, of therapists, of direct service providers that had been around for 10, 15, 20, 30, Travis, for 40 years. Because there's something in them, a passion, a love of what they do, and they do it well. I do believe that direct services that we provide is very unique compared to not all organizations, but too many organizations. What are some of the key programs and services that UCP offers? It's a good question because it's an array of services. We are not a cookie cutter. So our affiliates have their own autonomy. We're not a corporation. We're not a franchise. These organizations have decided to join United Cerebral Palsy because of our brand that's been around, again, for 75 years because of the respect that we have on the advocacy level, our research level, and our therapy level, and so forth and so on. So one of the, I think this, all of the services that are provided by our affiliates are key, are vital, and many of them are life-saving. So there's transportation, right? We have some affiliates that focus on transportation that, that will move people and transport people from point A to point B to point C. And that's what they do. We have schools. We have pre-Ks that have children, typical children with disabilities. And that's a beautiful model that you have a pre-K. I'll give you an example, a pre-K that has typical kids that now are in an environment that includes kids with disabilities. And they eventually become advocates and they protect the kids when they go to to kindergarten and to go to public schools or private schools, but they are now their protectors from getting bullied. The kids with disabilities then are in an environment that they're now engaging with kids that are typical. So when they do go to kindergarten, first grade and second grade, it's something that they're not afraid of. So that's one. The others are day programs for children, day programs for adults, employment programs, Therapy programs, which are super important, which include early intervention programs. And now we're really focusing on early detection. So early detection is huge right now because we're still trying to figure it out around, not only around the nation, but around the world. And then we have many other 
programs like housing. There are housing programs for adults. We have adult programs. Um, we do know that we are in need of more adult programs, um, especially here in the United States. So we are trying to focus on trying to get more resources on that. So we do have an array of vital programs out there. And some that I mentioned um, have been very helpful for children to have more independences when they grow up. And having that early detection and early intervention is vital. When I was asked to speak last year at the United Cerebral Palsy Annual Conference in Las Vegas, I got to witness firsthand all the wonderful things that UCP does for the disability community, not just those with cerebral palsy. And one of the things that stood out to me was the lack of resources for adults who have cerebral palsy. Do you feel like that's one of the biggest challenges facing UCP right now? Travis, yes. First, let me begin by thanking you for being one of our guest speakers. So that was quite the honor. And it was great to meet also your mom. I remember her being there. So the answer is yes, that it is a challenge while the government, and I'm not blaming it solely on government, but while government does provide reimbursements and resources and funds for children to a certain age, and I believe it's around 2021, after that, the resources are not as readily available. And that is a challenge that we need to confront. And that's something that as not just UCP, but our other partner organizations, Easter Seals and Goodwill and others that are out there, is that we have to come together to figure out how we can better serve the adult population. Because I don't, I personally think that's falling short and that many people, even people like yourselves, are traveling thousands of miles for services when that shouldn't be happening. So the answer is yes. I think the challenging part is to find organizations that have the means to help in the ways that you're talking about, like UCP does for adults and children with cerebral palsy and other disabilities. I think housing, especially now with the economy as it is, it becomes more difficult for somebody to pay rent and even to live. And then you add disability on top of it, it becomes even more difficult. Yeah, Travis, about five years ago, I, I resurrected the research committee. And the research committee found, obviously, what they had in common was providing research and breakthroughs for children. But in that same committee, what has come up is that what are we doing for adults? So that's certainly a conversation. We need to put in a strategic plan to figure out what we can do and who's doing it out there because there are some best practices. And we want to make sure not just here on the national level, but globally, it's a global issue. So are there other countries that have best practices and how can we begin to emulate or learn from those best practices to provide better services for the adult community with disabilities. Can you talk about the role that volunteers play in UCP and how individuals can get involved in their local UCP? Because I know not every state has an affiliate. Yes. Yeah, so one, if there's a volunteer or somebody who wishes to volunteer in a particular state and they like to know if there's a UCP in their state, they can go to our website at ucp.org. That's ucp.org. And then in there, you can find, there's a section called find an affiliate, a window that opens up, find an affiliate, and you can go to your respective state and then to the city, and you'll see the nearby UCP if we do have one, because we do, we are in 30 states. If there is, then you would connect with that local UCP and share with them your interest in volunteering. When I was here at the local UCP in Phoenix, Arizona, we had great examples of volunteers. One was a corporation that would send their employees. That was Circle K. Circle K was a huge supporter of UCP of Central Arizona. And they would send the paint crew to go paint our buildings, right? During Christmas time, they would go and support the kids and they would dress up as Santa Claus or, or Mrs. Claus or Alves and then Easter time and the different holidays. So th those are the opportunities. I truly believe that in the United States, volunteerism is huge. 
And volunteerism is part of a sustainability for organizations. So if there are people out there who listen to this podcast that have some interest, they can simply just go again to ucp.org and find a find an affiliate that that I'm sure they would be welcome because we're always looking for good volunteers. That's great. And what are some of the main goals and priorities over the next few years with UCP? So last, about a year ago, and it took us maybe about another year to articulate what our goals are for the next three years. And the way we did it, the way at the national office, how we put the national priorities together was bringing in affiliates throughout the nation and in Canada to be part of this discussion that we would that we wanted to be very inclusive and that we did not and I did not want to roll out goals tactics milestones to our affiliates without their input and collaboration so we had a series of surveys we had some virtual calls and we had a summit we had an in person summit and we got together and we came up with four key goals and we also obviously the the strategic planning committee was part of this and these four goals travis came out of a deep discussion through the affiliate network and the four go- four goals are number 1 brand awareness our 75th anniversary this is still goal 1 and brand refresh why is because there's a challenge out there when folks see United Cerebral Palsy and they believe that United Cerebral, that we only serve children and adults with cerebral palsy. And while our focus continues to be and our priority is cerebral palsy, we do have programs and services and therapies for children and adults with autism, with developmental delays, with learning disabilities, with Down syndrome, and many other conditions. So that was goal number one, to make sure that we broaden that message. Goal number two is development, is on the fundraising level. How can we continue to fundraise? How do we fundraise in a way that our affiliates also benefit from? That we can fundraise on a national level, but also keeping in mind that if there are opportunities that our affiliates can benefit from those relationships with private donors, major gift donors, with corporations, with foundations, we're figuring out better strategies to do development out there, which is really tied to brand awareness as well. The third goal of four goals is advocacy. We've been known for many years to be one of the biggest advocates in Washington, D.C. on the federal level. And we've been partnering with, again, a lot of the national uh, partners out there, which is Ancor, Access, Goodwill, Easter Seals, and many others to make sure that there's legislation that benefits not only the disability community, but people that are providing those services that they get paid a meaningful wage and not minimum wage. Because what we found, Travis, is that that the typical direct service professional is our women women of color, they're black or Latina, and they're actually trying to survive by having three three jobs and still doing the work to provide valuable services as a direct service professional. So um, advocacy is huge for us. And then the last goal is increasing our affiliate um, footprint. So increasing our network in the United States, not only in a national level, but internationally in Canada. And now I'm having conversations in Mexico, in Monterrey, Mexico, with a group called Nuevo Amanecer. I've had, I've been invited last year to Mexico City to speak on how we can have three countries come together and share resources for the disability communities in Canada, in the US and in Mexico. And I got invited again this year. So last year was in Mexico City, In about two weeks, I'll be in Merida, Yucatan, at an international conference for cerebral palsy. I'm honored. I'm not a researcher, but I will be speaking about the work that we're doing at UCP on an international level. And also, I'll be introducing Dr. Carolina Galas, who is a a scientist, and she'll be speaking about genetics and cerebral palsy. So 
we do have that vision. I have a vision of globally connecting and we'll see how that goes in the next few years. So those are the four goals. Those are wonderful goals. And just to hear about how UCP is continuing to grow outside the United States, more into Canada and Mexico, I think it just adds more awareness and brings more opportunities to the table for advocacy and having other people know about UCP and put more resources back into the organization. Yes, this is, we're very excited about that. But what can be? We're very excited about. What has been the most rewarding aspect of your work with UCP? I think at two levels. One, as a CEO of a local affiliate that provides direct services, seeing the children hug their parents for the first time, when doctors had said there wouldn't be a lot of movement, hearing and being in conversation with young adults that had said that their doctors had said that they would never speak. And I would bring them up in at galas and have them speak, seeing those miracles when families would share with me that physicians would say that their children would never walk or run and to see them walk and running was quite, quite the miracle. And a child to give their parents the first hug, or they say, I love you for the first time. Those were very deep experiences for me. And that, that was an experience that that I acknowledge that it was the people that were providing the services, the direct service professional, the therapists, the clinicians, they were the ones that were beginning to open up the lives of children that perhaps some physicians gave up on. So the miracles were impactful for me, but they came through people who were very passionate and they shared the love and the care, the proper care that they needed, not just for the child, but for the families as well, and for young adults and adults as well. On a national level, the fact that almost eight years ago, the national office was heading towards bankruptcy, and that would have been a devastation for United Cerebral Palsy in the United States. But the fact that we turned it around and the fact that now we're not talking about financial sustainability at a level that we were seven years ago, but that in itself through a great collaboration, through great leaders um, on my board, through um, leaders like Diane Willish, who is a, one of my board chairs, and today Keith Graham, board members, my team, other collaborators, affiliates that said, we need to preserve, we need to save United Cerebral Palsy, and it's happening. We are looking, we're looking at Travis at the next 75 years. Are there any lessons learned or insights you've gained through your leadership at UCP that you'd like to share? Absolutely. I think one is listen for understanding, really begin to hear out, even if it's difficult, what those issues are, put a plan together, keep your word and get a solution to it. Second, I think CEOs should Understand that they're servant leaders that we're here to serve and that that goes a long way that if you're going to have somebody else roll up their sleeves, that you need to roll, roll up your sleeves as well. One example, Travis, was that we didn't have the budget for me to travel when I came on board seven years ago. So what I did was that in order for me to travel from Phoenix to DC, I couldn't stay in the hotels. We couldn't afford them. So I had some friends from the Jesuit community, the Catholic community, and I stayed at a Jesuit high school for $30 a night. I wanted to set an example to everybody that even as a CEO, that I can find an efficiency and find a way and find options to stay instead of doing the $300 a night in the DC. So while I was there, I was traveling, I was there 10 to 15 days out of the month. Then I found this great resource at a high school. I stayed in a room. If I came back early enough, then I would be joining the Jesuit priests in prayer. And then I would have a home cooked meal, not bad for 30 bucks a night in Washington, DC. Right. After that, the, the following month, they didn't have that room available anymore because it belonged to a professor. So then I actually was in a retreat house in a former convent in next to Catholic university. And that was $40 a day. That was a tough one because that was more of a dorm style type of situation. But as a leader, as the CEO, 
I wanted to set that example that even I can also roll up my sleeves, be efficient, be in a in a building all by myself. I think there was a crucifix, no TV, and the bathrooms weren't even in the room. It was a really like a dorm cell, but I was really very passionate about the mission and I wanted to be part of the solution. Those are some examples of what I believe true leadership is. I really appreciate your time today sharing your experiences with United Cerebral Palsy and how you've been such an amazing servant leader to your staff and volunteers and whoever you come across to promote the mission of UCP. So I really thank you for your time today and all the great work that you're doing in the community. Yeah, Travis, I thank you too for being a great advocate out there. You, you've been a great example for all of us as a self-advocate and joining us at our conference. And I really look forward for more collaboration with you and all the things that you're doing. And again, the success that has happened at United Cerebral Palsy has really been a collaborative effort of many people. Thank you for tuning in to today's show. Follow the podcast on social media at Off The Crutch or email Travis at offthecrutch at gmail.com.